Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And in this video, I will be talking about T.S. Eliot's famous essay, Tradition and Individual Talent. Now, I am discussing this essay in juxtaposition with Terry Eagleton's discussion of Eliot. And that appears uh, from page 33 to 36. And I must admit, that's a pretty scathing critique of Eliot. And I thought, since my students are reading Eagleton, and I'm hoping you're following my lectures on Eagleton too, so I thought that I should amplify as to why and what is Eagleton criticizing. So in the subsequent moments in this video, I will read parts of Eliot's original essay as to how is he defining tradition and the question of individual talent and what does it mean to us now as readers and what is Eagleton reading into that essay and other works of T.S. Eliot. I'll talk about that towards the end. So that's the plan. So let's see if I can bring up the essay, T.S. Eliot essay on screen, read a little bit and talk to you about it. So here we go. Now, please keep in mind that the whole essay is available uh, on Poetry Foundation's website, and I'll post a link to that below. But let's bring it up and let's read the first couple of paragraphs. And now, the essay was published in 1919, so that means immediately after the culmination of the First World War, and that is the backdrop that Eagleton is also talking about. So I read, in English writing, we seldom speak of tradition, though we occasionally apply its name in deploring its absence. We cannot refer to the tradition or to a tradition. At most, we employ the adjective in saying that the poetry of so-and-so is traditional or even too traditional. Seldom, perhaps, does the word appear except in a phrase of censure. If otherwise, it is vaguely appropriate, ap uh, approbative, with the implication as to the work approved of some pleasing archaeological reconstruction. You can hardly make the word agreeable to English ears without this comfortable reference to the reassuring science of archaeology. Certainly, the word is not likely to appear in our appreciations of living or dead writers. Every nation, every race has not only its own creative, but its own critical turn of mind and is, and is even more obvious, oblivious of the shortcomings and limitations of its critical habits than of those of its creative genius. We know or think we know from the enormous mass of critical writing that has appeared in the French language, the critical method or habit of the French, we only conclude we are such unconscious people that the French are more critical than we, and sometimes even plume ourselves a little with the fact as if the French were the less spontaneous. Perhaps they are, but we might remind ourselves that criticism is as inevitable as breathing and that we should be none the worse for art articulating what passes in our minds when we read a book and feel an emotion about it, for criticizing our own minds in their work of criticism. One of the facts that might come to light in this process is our tendency to insist when we praise a poet upon those aspects of his work in which he least re resembles anyone else. In these aspects or part of this work, we pretend to find what is individual, what is the peculiar essence of the man. We dwell with satisfaction upon the poets different from his predecessors, especially his immediate predecessors. We endeavor to find something that can be isolated in order to be enjoyed. Whereas if we approach a poet without this pre prejudice, we shall often find that not only the best, but the most individual parts of his work may be those in which the dead poets, his ancestors, assert their immortality most vigorously. And I do not mean the, 
impressionable period of of adolescence but the period of full maturity okay so a lot is packed in these first two paragraphs right it starts with his assertions about the english reading consciousness or reading habits right and the general assumption that english are slightly more spontaneous whereas the french are too much about critique and criticizing but he's pointing to one cultural tendency within the british scene now do also keep in mind that the we in eliot is the british we and we know that eliot came from united states but becomes more british than the british themselves right uh so he is assigning a certain national characteristic to british approach to reading literature one that people think they are less critical than the french and that their approach to poetry is more spontaneous but they also have a habit within a poet's work of valorizing what comes across as individual trait of a certain poet in opposition to what could be construed as something that the poet might have worked on from a previous tradition now in the first paragraph of course what he mentions is that the tradition somehow is considered a bad word in english poetry and the only time it is given some credence to is in the kind of intellectual archaeological work where someone goes back and studies the progression of poetry or a certain genre with an emphasis on what traditions existed before it how do they bleed into the next one but tradition as being offered as something that could still invigorate contemporary poetry by and large what he says is is considered a bad thing and the tendency in his opinion in english reading public or in english critics is to try to isolate that part of a poet's work that can be peculiar to that poet that stands out as individual work of craft or thought because that is what is being valorized the individual talent so that's where we are when we read the first two paragraph he is arguing for tradition and its significance in a different way and he is also suggesting that even when we are looking for that individual strain in a poem what we also need to account for is the vigorous and enlightening presence of a poetic tradition within the work of a poet and maybe we need to think about that a little more that's why the essay is entitled you know tradition and individual talent so i'll read a little more and then we can talk about it a little more yet if the only form of tradition of handing down consisted in following the ways of the immediate generation before us in a blind or timid adherence to its success tradition should positively be discouraged we have seen many such simple currents soon lost in the sand and novelty is better than repetition tradition is a matter of much wider significance it cannot be inherited and if you want it you must obtain it by great labor it involves in the first place the historical sense which may which we may call nearly indispensable to anyone who would continue to be a poet beyond his 25th year and the historical sense involves a perception not only of the pastness of the past but but of its presence the historical sense compels a man to write not merely with his own generation in his bones but with a feeling that the whole of the literature of europe from homer and within it the whole of the literature of his own country has a simultaneous existence and composes a simultaneous order this historical sense which is a sense of the timeless as well as of the temporal and of the timeless and of the temporal together is what makes a writer traditional and it is at the same time what makes a writer most acutely conscious of his place in time of his own contemporaneity no poet 
No artist of any art has his complete meaning alone. His significance, his appreciation is the appreciation of his relation to the dead poets and artists. You cannot value him alone. You must set him for contrast and comparison among the dead. I mean this as a principle of aesthetic, not merely historical criticism. The necessity that he shall confirm that he shall cohere is not one-sided. What happens when a new work of art is created is something that happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it. The existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves which is modified by the introduction of the new, the really new work of art among them. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives. For order to persist after the supervention of novelty, the whole existing order must be, if ever so slightly, altered. And so the relations, proportions, values of each work of art towards the whole are readjusted. And this is conformity between the old and the new. Whoever ever has approved this idea of order of the form of European, of English literature, will not find it preposterous that the past should be altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. And the poet who is aware of this will be aware of great difficulties and responsibilities. So what we get from these two passages that I just read is first of all you cannot become part of the tradition simply by existing in a time frame. It's not a passive awareness. And two, it's not necessarily just the awareness of tradition that precedes your time. What he's talking about is something that involves deep engagement with an extensive history of tradition itself. Okay, so that's why if you're just relying on what came before you, that's not the tradition that he means. What he means is that a laborious process of informing yourself, if you're a poet, of the whole system of tradition of, let's say, Western poetry. Homer is there. So that means all the periods. Then what he's also positing is that that tradition exists as an organic, complete whole right? And knowing that is important. And then if that knowledge runs through your poetry, then you are being an individual poet, but your poetry is good because it's aware of the whole tradition of poetry. And that changes your poetry because it's imbued with the tradition. But another claim that he's making, we'll see if he can justify it or not, is that by adding something to that whole poetic tradition, since the tradition is already fully formed, your work has a place in it. It's absorbed in it, right? And it will only be absorbed in it if it has the vein of tradition running through it, right? But it will also then slightly alter the tradition itself and alter the past. So the work that you're doing in the present has the capacity to be traditional if you're aware, if you've done the laborious work of knowing your tradition, right? Because only then you will become aware of it. You will not be able to become aware of it accidentally, right? Then your work will carry that tradition in it. And hence, when you write your poem or your works, they will fit within that system of tradition. But in the process of doing that, they will also alter the tradition, right? Alter the past. We'll see how he carries through that argument, but that is what he's arguing. What is important to note is that the awareness of the tradition doesn't happen through osmosis. It is laborious work, and it will need for the poet to actually go out, read, and learn, and inform him or herself of the tradition, right? Now, the question of tradition is what, you know, Eagleton challenges, and we'll get to it towards the end, but let us read a little more and see where he takes us from here. In a peculiar sense, he will be aware also that he must inevitably be judged by the standards of the past. I say judged 
not amputated by them, not judged to be as good as or worse or better than the dead, and certainly not judged by the canons of dead critics. It is a judgment, a comparison, in which two things are measured by each other. To conform merely would be for the new work not really to, to conform at all. It would not be new and would therefore not be a work of art. And we do not quite say that the new is more valuable because it fits in. But its fitting in is a test of its value, a test, it is true, which can only be slowly and cautiously applied, for, for we are none of us infallible judges of conformity. We say it appears to conform and is perhaps individual, or it appears in individual and may conform, but we are hardly likely to find that it is one and not the other. To proceed to a more intelligible exposition of the relation of the poet to the past, he can neither take the past as a lump, an indiscriminate bolus, nor can he form himself wholly on one or two private admirations, nor can he form himself wholly upon one preferred period. The first course is inadmissible, the second is an important experience of youth, and the third is a pleasant and highly desirable supplement. The poet must be very conscious of the main current, which does not at all flow invariably through the most distinguished reputations. He must be quite aware of the obvious fact that art never improves, but that the material of art is never quite the same. He must be aware that the mind of Europe, the mind of his own country, a mind which he learns in time to be much more important than his own private mind, is a mind which changes, and that this change is a development which abandons nothing in root, which does not superannuate either Shakespeare or Homer or the rock drawings of the Magdalenian draftsmen, that this development, refinement perhaps, complication certainly, is not from the point of view of the artist any improvement perhaps not even an improvement from the point of view of the psychologist, or not to the extent which we imagine, per perhaps only the end based upon a complication in economics and machinery. But the difference between the present and the past is that the conscious present is, is, is an awareness of the past in a way, and to an extent which the past's awareness of itself cannot show. So now that we have uh, established the necessity of the presentness of the past in the present work, he's trying to now highlight, you know, how would a writer engage with the past tradition? And in these passages it comes very clear, is that when we look at these texts, we look at it from the point of view of conformity to the tradition, and then the originality of the individual work, right? So if we say that this completely conforms to the tradition but there is no individual talent there, then it's not necessarily new art. But if the case is reversed, you know, if there is some form of an originality but it doesn't show an, a connection with the past, does it become a more artistic work? What he's trying to highlight is that that continuity is exceptionally important. It is not conformity, but embedding your work within the tradition is crucial. Uh, but what he's saying is that the judgment of this conformity shouldn't be so that it absolutely you know, amputates, that's the word he's using, a writer's imagination. It should augment that. That's my understanding of it. And then he goes on to say that there are ways of engaging with the tradition, right? Uh, you could just rely on a few private things that you prefer, 
or you could rely on, uh, you know, or it be, you know, you could pick up a certain period. But reliance on tradition or engagement with it cannot be piecemeal. That's what he's trying to highlight in these pas passages, right? And what he's also saying is, is that, you know, art doesn't change over time. Okay, cool. But in, in accounting for the presence of the tradition in your work, you can't just take a slice or a few preferred authors. You must account for the whole tradition because nothing is outside of the tradition if it is part of your civilizational tradition or your national tradition. So the people that he's mentioning from the cave drawings to Shakespeare and others, right? Nothing is discarded in root. That's what he's saying. So he's offering this main current of a tradition that a poet must place his or herself in. Now remember, we already talked about it is not accidental. It requires work, so that means you must learn the tradition. And another argument then, then he says is that we have a certain advantage over the past, people would say, is because we are aware of the past and the newness that's being added to it. But the past changes, but it is it cannot be aware of its own pastness and its own changes. Uh, so I missed one quote in the previous reading, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it here so that I don't have to go back to the reading more. It says, someone said, the red, dead writers are remote from us because we know so much more than they said. Precisely, and they are that which, which we know. So obviously the dead writers, the canon or the tradition, they are not aware of what a poet is doing, but a poet is aware of them, right? Being aware of the main current of the tradition then already puts you in touch with the tradition, right? Your work fits in there, right? It becomes a good work of art, not because of your individual talent, right? but because it, in a certain way, conforms to the general expectations of a tradition, but in the process it also changes the past. That's the argument that he is trying to make. Now, this is where Eagleton challenges his assumptions, because the tradition that he is invoking is very European, and it's very conservative, right? And he also is writing this essay against the claims of Romanticism, remember, right? Which focused on the bard, on the poet, and on the feelings. But forcing the poet to the realm of reason, but also connecting it to somehow a singular tradition. What the, he then is moving the writer is into this conservative understanding of tradition itself. And that's one of the aspects of this essay that Eagleton criticizes. Uh, we'll g get to it in a minute, but let me, I'm not going to read the whole thing now. I'll just pick up a few more passages that I think are significant in understanding how he is defining tradition and retrieval of it and incorporation of it within a poet's writing. And then I'll conclude with my discussion of what Eagleton has to say about it. Honest criticism and sensitive appreciation are directed not upon the poet, but upon the poetry. If we attend to the confused cries of the newspaper critics and the susurrus of popular repetition that follows, we shall hear the names of poets in great numbers. If we seek not blue book knowledge, but the enjoyment of poetry and ask for a poem, we shall seldom find it. I've tried to point out the importance of relation of the poem to other poems by other authors and suggested the conception of poetry as a living whole of all the poetry that has ever been written. The other aspect of this impersonal theory of poetry is the relation of the poem to its author, and I hinted by an analogy that the mind of the mature poet differs from that of the immature one 
not precisely in any valuation of personality, not being necessarily more interesting or having more to say, but rather by being a more finely perfected medium in which special or very varied feelings are at liberty to enter into new combinations. The analogy was that of the catalyst. When the two gases previously mentioned are mixed in the presence of a filament of platinum, they form sulfurous acid. This combination takes place only if the pl platinum is present. Nevertheless, the newly formed acid contains no trace of platinum, and the platinum itself is apparently unaffected, has remained inert neutral and unchanged. The mind of the poet is the shred of platinum. It may partly or exclusively operate upon the experience of the man himself, but the more perfect the artist, the more completely separate in him will be the man who suffers and the mind which creates. The more perfectly will the mind digest and transmute the passions which are its material. The experience, you will notice, the elements which enter the presence of the transforming catalyst are of two kinds, emotions and feelings. The effect of a work of art upon the person who enjoys it is an, is an experience different in kind from any experience of art. It may be formed out of one emotion or maybe a combination of several and various feelings inhering for the writer in particular words or phrases or images may be added to compose the final result or great poetry may be made without the direct use of any emotion whatever. Combo composed out of feelings solely. Being loose of emotions, but an escape from emotions. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. But of course, only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from these things. This essay proposes to halt at the frontier of metaphysics or mysticism and confine itself to such practical conclusions as can be applied by the responsible person interested in poetry. To divert interest from the poet to the poetry is a laudable aim, for it would conduce to a juster estimation of actual poetry, good and bad. There are many people who appreciate the expression of sincere emotion in verse, and there is a smaller number of people who can appreciate technical ex excellence. But very few know when there is an expression of significant emotion, emotion which has its life in the poem and not in the history of the poet. The emotion of art is impersonal, and the poet cannot reach this impersonality without surrendering himself wholly to the work to be done, and he is not likely to know what is to be done unless he lives in what is not merely the present, but the present moment of the past, unless he is conscious not of what is dead, but of what is already living. Okay, I understand those references to the catalyst and experiments are a bit confusing, but it's pretty simple. What he's saying is that if in a chemical process when you match these two elements, the catalyst is platinum, right? And that's the poet's mind. And when you bring tradition and feelings and emotions together, the only thing that must remain unchanged is the poet's mind. So the idea then is poetry is an outcome of the past and the poet's person, mature poet's person, without infusing it with raw emotions. So unlike Romanticism, where a poet was expressing his or herself in poetry, what he's saying is that what a poem must express is itself. And how does it become itself? Because the poet has diligently poured over the tradition of poetry within which he or she is working. And that's why he calls it impersonal criticism of poetry, that the criticism shouldn't be about great poets and what makes a poet great, but it should be focused on the poem itself. And the value of the poem then is not based in what kind of emotions it invokes or does it carry the poet's personality in it. No, it should be 
in juxtaposition with the poetic tradition. And by that, it's not one period or one poet. It's the whole trajectory of the poetic tradition. So the poet in this process then becomes someone, if you heard the concluding paragraph, who is writing in the present, right? but is guided by the past, the historical past of the poetic tradition itself. And in the process of writing the poetry, the poet is not writing his or herself. The poet is writing a poem which is determined by the tradition, right? And hence becomes impersonal. Now when you, me, and I read and me feel moved by the poem, we feel moved by the poem itself and not by the emotions of the poet. That's the point. It's crucial to understand that distinction because this is the move to more technical aspects of poetry. In order to be a good poet, you have to know the poetic tradition and then you have to detach your own person from the poem as a poet because the poem is no longer an expression of your own self, but kind of an expression of a virtuosic performance, right? Which is informed by the tradition, is written in the present, but is deeply connected to the tradition. So the question of individual talent then falls by the wayside because you can't just sit and write a poem. You can only write a good poem if you are aware of the tradition, if you are aware, self-aware of your own emotions and your feelings, and you can make that distinction, right? And then write a poem which also is deeply informed by the past, is in conversation with the past, formalistically, content-wise. So the poetry that will come out of it, it would be impersonal. And any value that it carries in terms of moving the audience and everything else would be part of the craft itself. This is move into modernism, right? And that's what he is discussing here. Now let's look into what Eagleton has to say about Eliot. And it starts on page 33 on the book, I highly recommend it. And what Eagleton is, is, says is that um, is it is not until the appearance of T.S. Eliot that English literature began to recuperate because it was dying. Eliot, Eliot's own solution is an extreme right-wing authoritarianism. Men and women must sacrifice their petty personalities and opinions to an impersonal order. So this is not just based on this essay. Think of the main concern of this essay. There is a thing called tradition which is larger than you and me, right? And in order to become a good poet, you must depersonalize yourself and let the tradition dictate what good poetry is, right? If you apply it to the global politics post-1918, what is happening, right? Rise of fascism, right? There is this idea that the national leaderships have failed their people and people are increasingly looking for strong men. This philosophy of not involving your own emotions or even your own so-called original thoughts but relying on a larger current of tradition to define what constitutes good poetry then falls deeply within that way of thinking which in its extreme form becomes Ezra Pound, right? Yeah. And his affiliation with fascism. But th that's one of the major problems that Eagleton has with this philosophy where if you pull out the agency of the poet and overemphasize the role of tradition, then what you're also doing in the political realm is overemphasizing the lo role of larger elite structures that determine the world for you. So also there is a certain kind of elitis elitism in Eliot's poetry itself, but the way he wants us to engage with poetry, right? And, and I read a little more. A literary work can be valid only by existing in the tradition. We just talked about it. As a Christian can be saved only by living in God. All poetry may be literature, but only some poetry is literature, depending on whether or not the tri tradition happens to flow through it. So if you are defining the value of the poem in its congruity with the tradition, and that too an erudite 
large tradition, then obviously to become a good poet, you have to go and learn that tradition, but then that tradition becomes the over-determining factor in constituting what is good and what is bad poetry, right? And if you are insisting that the poet must depersonalize his or herself, then what is the poet expressing? The tradition itself which determines his or her voice. You take the poet's agency out, then the dominant tradition speaks, right? And if the dominant tradition speaks, it's not going to be you know, the liberal fringe or the progressive fringe, it says going to be the dominant strain of culture that you will follow, that you will consider your national tradition, your civilizational tradition. And that is the aspect of Eliot's emphasis that Eagleton is criticizing. And what Eagleton is also criticizing is that right at the time when millions of people have died in the war, we are being told to write the kind of poetry that retrieves a certain uniform tradition and is over-determined by that. And it is elitist because you have to know all the illusions. I mean, think of the wasteland. And then you have to do the kind of poetry which is no longer in touch with what is happening in the real world, but is retrieving this tradition of literariness and then trying to write in that tradition. So. Overall, then, if you look at the tendency of the early modernist writers, especially poets, Cubism, and everyone else, the movement becomes increasingly conservative, right? And it becomes conservative because they have had this experience called the First World War, right? And they have lost faith in democracy, they have lost faith in the systems that existed before the war, and they are increasingly moving in politics to more and more centralized fascist systems of government. And if you think of tradition as an over-determining factor, right, then you are also going for something that over-determines in a fascist way the value of literature. Literature also is increasingly becoming more uh, non-representational. Cubism is rising, right? Uh, Ezra Pound and others, right? And the, the poetry that they are writing increasingly has not many words in it. You fill the gaps. So what is going to fill that gap? The tradition itself for you. So these are some of the critiques that Eagleton mounts. Uh, for Eliot and his influence. And uh, I would highly recommend that, you know, you should read the trajectory of what Eliot starts and where it goes in its extreme forms and what kind of problems does it rise. So to sum up Eliot's argument, don't focus on the poet, focus on the poem. A poem is a technical thing which is aware of the tradition within which it is, a, it is being produced. The poet's job is to depersonalize his or her own presence in a poem and let the tradition speak for it. The value of the poem will be judged from how does it rely on the tradition, where does it fit, and in doing so it becomes an original piece, but it is also a continuation of the tradition. And the reading of poems should be the reading of the poems and not necessarily the reading of the poets within the poems. So these are some of the thoughts that I have on it. I'm pretty sure I've missed quite a lot. There is never really a comprehensive reading of any text that you can perform. So I hope you'll read it more carefully than I did and we'll have some questions. And if you do, send them my way and I will try to answer them. Thank you so much and stay safe and as always, Peace and love.